pray. Everybody said, amen. Listen, uh, let's just get a quick poll here. Just, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to, but I, I, th I find it funny people's Chris, difference in, differences in Christmas, right? Uh, like, today is the official start of Christmas in the church calendar. Like, today's the official start. But how many of you uh, have not put your tree up? Like, you're not, you're not there yet, right? Yeah, that's me. It's me as well. How many of you put your tree up this week? Like, after Thanksgiving? That's a lot, yeah. How many of you have already decorated, like, Three weeks ago, before Thanksgiving ever started. Right, yeah. You people, overachievers. Right? Uh, how many of you have begun listening to Christmas music about a month ago? Yeah. Come on, wow. Right, all right, right. So, just so you know, in church, Christmas don't start till today. Right? Like, this is the time, this first Sunday, this is the first Sunday of what, in church history is called Advent. This is a time where we're preparing for the coming of Christ. The first coming of Christ. We're preparing to celebrate the first coming of Christ. How Jesus came and He was born of a virgin from Mary. Born of a virgin. Amen? Do you believe that? Because if you don't, you don't believe in the same Jesus that I do. People are trying to say that this is not how Jesus was born. People are trying to take this out of Christian doctrine. People are trying to take you away from who Jesus really is. That's happening. But my Jesus, God, He was born. Whoa, he was born of a virgin. And we have got to make sure that that, that we believe that. Because if Jesus wasn't born of a virgin, then He wasn't sinless. Like, it's that serious of a thing for us. And if Jesus wasn't without sin, then He can't die and atone for our sin. Right? If He's not the spotless Lamb who was slain for all of our sins. Listen, this is, this is so important for us. We, we, we often glass over the story of the birth of Christ and we look forward to all types of other things. But we today, the start of this period... We have got to look towards the first coming of Christ, the birth of Christ. And we've got to be excited about that. Amen? We've got to be excited. We've got to be preparing our hearts for the birth of Christ. Get ready for the birth of Christ. Amen? Are you getting ready for that? I pray, if you have kids, I pray that you're getting them ready for the birth of Christ. Right? I know we focus on a lot of other things. But get, get ready for the birth of Christ and celebrate that. Was George Jesus born on December 25th? Probably not, but this is the time we celebrate it. So let's do that, amen? Let's get excited about that. Right? So my prayer is that we're preparing for the coming of Christ. And uh, listen, you can find all kinds of devotionals out there. Advent devotionals, devotionals leading up to the birth of Christ. Please begin to read those things and dive into those things because we are ready for the... We're also preparing for the second coming of Christ too. Like this is all coming together. But I want to I want to go to a text this morning which is the most important one of the most important texts on the birth of Jesus Christ. It is the it's the most important text in my opinion in my mind. The most important text and it's not going to come from the New Testament. It's going to come from the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 7. So if you're there, flip to Isaiah 7. Open your phone to Isaiah 7. It'll be on the screen as well. But I want to set the scene for you here. Just so you understand what is going on. Because context is huge for us. The scene is this. Go back to that map for a second, please. Uh, the scene is this. The, the, the nation of Israel, the Jewish nation, at this time has been split into two different kingdoms. You following along with me? You with me here? It's two different kingdoms. The nation of Judah, which is the southern kingdom, and the nation of Israel, which is the northern kingdom. And it's going to be down like in the bottom left of that map. You're going to see Israel, you're going to see Judah, you're going to see Syria, right? You got it? You there? Right? So the nation of Israel is the northern half of the Jewish nation and the nation of Judah is the southern half of the Jewish nation. This nation has split because they couldn't settle on who was king. Right? So they split. And you have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Now, Isaiah is prophesying to more towards the southern kingdom of Judah and he's prophesying towards the, the Davidic line of kings. 
which is the nation of Judah is the Davidic line of kings. Remember, Jesus comes from what lineage? The lineage of David, the Davidic line. Like he is the king following in the footsteps of David the king. Amen, right? This is all very important and this is all huge for us. So, the southern kingdom of Judah, all these kingdoms are getting threatened by the nation of Assyria. Right? This nation of Assyria is attack this is history, I love it. It's attacking all kinds of different nations and just taking over stuff. Right? So don't confuse this. The nation of Assyria, which is up top, then you have the nations of Syria and Israel down towards the bottom left. Those two nations are going to team up and try to take over the nation of Judah. Because they're all trying to rally against that big nation of Assyria that's conquering everything, okay? You with me still? I know that can be a little confusing, but that sets the scene for Isaiah chapter 7, all right? Look at this text as we go through here. Isaiah chapter 7, starting at verse 1, okay? In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah. So stop there. Ahaz is the king of Judah, that southern kingdom. He's the king of Judah. Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it. But they could not yet mount an attack against it. So stop there for real quick. That nation of Syria, those two kings, Syria and Israel, are coming against the nation of Judah, threatening to overcome it and attack it. Right? Threatening to overcome it and attack it. That's what's going on. Verse 2, when the house of David, Judah, was told Syria is in a league with Ephraim. I always mess that word up. The heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. So this nation of Judah, they catch wind of what is going to happen. This, that these two kingdoms are trying to come and overcome them. And when you have threats of war, people get scared, don't they? People get scared when you have threats of war. People in America are scared right now on threats of war somewhat, right? I, I hear people all the time talking about North Korea, talking about all these different places, right? Not scared of what could possibly happen. Nobody wants to go to war. Nobody wants these things to happen. So they hear about this. Judah hears about this. And they begin to shake like the trees in the wind. They begin to shake. They're scared of what could happen. Because you've got two nations joining up against each other or with each other to come against one nation. That's pretty powerful, right? That could be scary. And the Lord said, verse 3, And the Lord said, Go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jacob, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. And say to him, Be careful, be quiet, do not fear, do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands. At the fierce... Anger of Rezin in Syria, the son of Remaliah. Stop there for a second. Why would, why would the king be at the, the place of water? Right? Think about this for a second. The king, Isaiah hears from God. He's a prophet of God. God says, go meet king, the king at the end of the conduit, where the water is coming from. Because that is the easiest way to attack a city that's got fortified walls. Right? I mean, how do you attack them? You attack through the water system. You can destroy a whole kingdom just by getting them sick and killing them through water, poison in the water, things in the water. So he's checking the water system. This is what's going on. He's scared that those two kings might do something to their water in that city of Jerusalem. That's what he's scared about. So Isaiah meets him there. And he says, don't be afraid. I know these two kingdoms up here are coming, coming together. I know they may have more people than we have. I know they may have more soldiers than we have. But do not be afraid of them. I don't know what you're going through in life but that you're scared of. But God's probably saying, don't be afraid. I got this. Amen? Right? Don't be afraid. I have got this. Got it. I'm with you. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the Bible says He's with you forever. Amen? He never leaves you, never forsakes you. He's with you. Right? Whatever you're going through, whatever seems like is coming against you, He's with you. Don't fear. Do not tremble. Do not shake. 
like a tree in the wind. Right? Anybody ever been in a tree in the wind? Like, I've been deer hunting and my, my grandpa hangs these tree stands, right? And he'll hang them in little trees like that big around. And you're up there in the tree stand, you're going... <laughs> Couldn't stand up and shoot a bow at a deer right now. I'm, the whole the tree is doing a circle. Right? He's like 70 years old. He's climbing up these trees and get. I don't know how he does it. Anyways, but you know, don't be afraid. Don't be shaken in the wind. Don't be scared is what Isaiah is saying to the king. He's saying, don't be scared. Even though this king, has, this king of Ahaz is, is not a good king at all. But anyways, he's saying, don't be scared of these two kingdoms. Look at verse 5. Because Syria and Ephraim... And the son of Remaliah have devised evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and terrify it, and let us conquer it for ourselves, and set up the son of Tabeel as the king in the midst of it. So the whole point of what these two kingdoms are trying to do, they're trying to take over Judah and put another king in place so they can do whatever they want. That's essentially what they're trying to do. They're trying to put another king in the place of Ahaz. They're trying to put another king on the throne of the king of David, which is very important. Right? Because Jesus comes from the line of David. This is important. Verse 7, Thus says the Lord, It shall not stand. It shall not come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin, and within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered from being a people. Like, that's prophecy right there, amen, right? It's specific. He's saying in 65 years, that nation of Israel, which is what Ephraim is turned to tribe, the nation of Israel will be destroyed. That northern kingdom, that Jewish tribe will be destroyed in 65 years. And that's exactly what happens. They're destroyed. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria. And the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. So he's saying, these two kingdoms, don't worry about them. Do not worry about them. What they're trying to plan, it shall not... Look at that verse. Verse 7. It shall not stand. It shall not come to pass. God is saying, this is not going to happen. So don't be afraid of it. Do not be afraid of it. And look at this last line. This is a huge point. This last line in verse 9. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. Do you catch it? Another word for firm would be stand. This, people, this is the truth for you today. Ready? If you do not stand in your faith, you will not stand at all, is what the, what the saying goes. The point is this. If you don't put your faith and your trust in God in the toughest situations in your life, you will fall. That's the point. Do you know that about your life? Amen? Right? If you do not, if you're going up against some of the toughest circumstances that you will ever face, you better put your faith in one place. God. You better put your trust in God. You better not trust in all these other things that you can trust in. Because if you trust in those, you're going to fall. But if you trust in God, you're on a firm foundation. Amen? You're on a firm foundation. If you trust in God, nothing, you're not on sand, you're on the solid rock, is what the New Testament says, right? Like if you stand trusting in God, you cannot fall. Amen? You cannot fall. That's why the saying, if God is for us, who can be against us in Romans chapter 8, right? It doesn't matter what, if you just put your trust in Jesus. Put your trust in God. If you don't, you will fall. Maybe not in this life, but the next. Amen? Truth. You may have a great life here on this, in this world, but if you do not put your faith and trust in Jesus, you are going to fall in eternity. Now, if you're a Christian, you don't put your faith and trust in Jesus here on th in this life, you could fall too. Things can happen because you don't put your faith and trust in Jesus. This is exactly what happens with this nation of Judah and King Ahaz. What has God told the king? Put your faith in me, nothing's going to happen. Amen, right? Put your faith in me, nothing is going to happen. These two kingdoms are not going to overcome you. But Ahaz is an evil king. You have this in the nation of Israel. You have good king, bad king, good king, bad, 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 right? Like y'all in a row, like bad, bad, bad. And you got Hezekiah that comes up next. He's good, 
right? It's like good king, bad king, right? It happens. Ahaz is bad. Ahaz is evil. He's an evil king. He, all he wants to do is trust himself. He wants to do things for himself. He wants to worship other gods, all these other types of things. Now look at this. God says, put your faith in me. It's not going to happen. Ahaz does the exact opposite. And it ends up costing the whole nation of Judah. One person's actions. Look at this. Verse 10. It says again, The Lord spoke to Ahaz through the prophet Isaiah. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. God says, ask anything as a sign for that thing I just said. I'll give you a sign. Ask anything. I'll give you a sign that I'm telling the truth. These two kingdoms are not going to overcome you. You following with me? He's asked, God has told him to ask for a sign. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Right? He's trying to sound like he really loves God, but he doesn't. This is all for show. Right? He hates God. He's, he's worshiping all other, all other types of gods. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. And here's the sign. You ready? Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Amen? Now who's that sound like? Who's that sound like? Jesus, right? And we're talking about the year 722 B.C. Somewhere right at like 700 B.C. We're talking about 700 years before the birth of Christ. Isaiah is putting on, on, not paper, but he's putting on a scroll. He's writing this in a scroll. You shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall be born of a virgin, right? 700 years before Jesus ever comes on the scene. But here's what I want to tell you. This is a sign for the promise that he just said earlier. Alright? There are three types of signs. Let me put this in uh, simple terms here for us. Right? I'll give you a scenario here. Okay? And I'm trying to come up with one off the top of my head here. I know what I'm going to say for the other thing here. Alright? So, let's say Pastor Josh is going to move to Africa. Right? This is what's going to happen. He's going to move to Africa, become a missionary. This is what's going to happen 10 years from now. I'm not prophesying this at all, by the way. But 10 years from now, he's going to move to Africa and uh, be a missionary there. But I'm going to give you a sign, church, that that's going to happen. Pastor Earl is going to grow a full head of hair. Right? That's the sign that Josh is going to be leaving for Africa. When Pastor Earl grows a full head of hair... This is not going to happen, by the way. Right? When he grows a full head of Donald Trump hair, right? That is when Pastor Josh is going, you know what, that statement, he's moving to Africa, that's true. Yeah, that's the sign that that's true. You with me? You see how a sign works? You see how a sign works? Anybody ever ask for a sign from God? Right? You don't have to raise your hand, but people do it all the time, right? God, if you want this to, if you want this to happen, just give us a sign. People ask for them. So here's how this works. There's three different types of signs, right? Pastor, there's a simultaneous sign, which means I moved to Africa at the same exact time Pastor Earl grows a full head of hair. They happen the exact same time, simultaneous, right? The other one is this. Past, it's it's a, a precursor. So the sign comes before what actually happens. So if Pastor Earl grows, comes in here next week with a full head of hair, you know Josh is moving to Africa 10 years from now, right? It comes before. Right? It comes before. But there also is a sign that comes after. So Josh, Josh moves to Africa in 10 years, and then 50 years later, Pastor Earl grows a full head of hair when he's 97 years old. Right? It's, a, it's an after thing. So here's the point of what's happening in Isaiah chapter 7. Is this. God told through the prophet Isaiah that these two kingdoms are not going to overtake you. They're not. It's not going to come to pass. And here is the sign that what I said is true in 722 B.C. The virgin shall bear a son and we shall call his name Emmanuel. And it happens 700 years later. Wild. But that's exactly what's going on. God was speaking truth in that day, and He's confirmed it in our day. 
not in our day, but in, in Jesus' day, right? Like, he confirmed it. 2,000 years ago, God confirmed this. That's pretty cool, right? That's awesome. And here's the point. He's confirming this truth. If you put your faith in God, you will stand. Amen, right? I think about it that way. The birth of Christ shows me that if I put my faith in Christ, I will stand. If I put my faith and trust in God, I will not fall. Because that is what was said 700 years ago through the prophet Isaiah. And Jesus being born of a virgin is that sign confirming it. People, Jesus being born the way that he was is proof of who he is. It's proof that if you put your faith and trust in Him, you will have everlasting life. Jesus' birth is proof of what the prophet said in that, verse, in that verse number 9. If you are not firm in your faith, you will not stand. Jesus is proof of that. Listen, this is a huge text. Because there are people out there who are trying to say, that's not what that text means at all, right? Because they have to say that. Because according to them, prophecy doesn't exist, right? According to them, there is no such thing as a God who knows the future, right? They're trying to say, and according to them, there is no person who could be born of a virgin. But they, they don't know who my God is, amen? They don't know who my God is. Because we know what this verse means, 14, that the virgin is going to conceive and bear a son and she'll call his name Emmanuel because Matthew tells us what that verse means. 700 years later, Matthew says in verse 1, 22 and 23, look what he says. All this, the birth of Jesus, took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So people, we know what Isaiah chapter 7 means because Matthew tells us. He tells us that Isaiah was talking about Jesus. He tells us that. Isaiah is talking about Jesus. Jesus is the sign. Jesus is the sign for you. And as you're expecting for Christmas to come, for the birth of Jesus to come. I want you to, to be expecting and be planning and be looking towards that birth of Christ and say, that is the sign, God. That's the sign that whatever's going on in my life right now, I've got to stand firm in you. Whatever's going on, that's the sign, God. That's the sign that if I don't put my faith and trust in you, I will fall. That's a sign, God, that what you said 700 years ago has come to pass in your Son. Jesus is a sign for us. He's a sign that if we put our faith and trust in God and we trust in Him, no matter what, we will stand. Now, is that what Ahaz does? Absolutely not. Like I said, Ahaz is an evil king. I love to read on some of, the stuff, some of the stuff that all these kings do in Israel because some of it is just terrible. Ahaz, I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe Ahaz sacrificed his own son or his own child to the God of Baal. He sacrificed his own child to a false god. That's the king of Israel right now. God's chosen people is a guy who would sacrifice his own child to a false god. That's what's going on. So you know how evil this king is. He's not going to trust in the Lord. He's going to trust in what he, himself. That's what he's going to do. Look what happens next. He shall eat curds and honey. They're talking about the child. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse evil and choose good. Normally curds and honey means that place is, is like in dire straits. It's like the Great Depression, right? It's like that's what it is. You're eating curds and honey and that's it. Like, it's bad. It's a bad situation going on. For before the boy knows how to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and your people and upon your father's house such days that have not come since the days that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. So here's what God is saying. God is saying to that king of Ahaz, since you're not going to trust me, this is what's going to happen. That king of Assyria is going to come and overtake you. 
He's going to come over to because here's what Ahaz does. Ahaz creates this alliance with the nation of Assyria. Go back to that map for me if you can. Ahaz creates this alliance with that big nation of Assyria up top so that he, can, he feels protected. Right? He's creating this alliance with this nation of Assyria so that he feels protected. He's not trusting in God. He's trusting in another nation to help him. It's not what we do, amen? We don't trust in other things. We trust in God. We don't trust in all this other stuff. We trust in God. That's not what Ahaz does. Ahaz begins to trust in the king of Assyria to make sure that these other two tribes don't overtake him. Basically what he's saying is, we'll just go underneath your kingdom. I'll be, I'll be one of your kings for you. Right? Verse 18. In that day... In that day, the Lord will whistle for the fly that is at the end of the streams of Egypt and for the bee that is at the land of Assyria. And they will all come and settle in the steep ravines and in the clefts of the rocks and all the thorn bushes and all the pastures. This, see, this is what's amazing. Ahaz puts his trust in Assyria and Assyria ends up turning their back on him and backstabbing him, pretty much. Backstabbing Ahaz. And it, here's what ends up happening. 200,000 people in the nation of Judah actually end up being killed or sent into exile because this, this king chose not to trust God. Think about that for a second. 200,000 people are taken into exile because this king does not trust God. Here's the point that I think God wants you to know today. You don't know what decisions you make, who they are going to affect. Amen? You don't know that. Right? You do not know the decisions you make today affect other people. Amen? Right? They affect other people. If you don't trust in God as a, dad, as a father or a mother, if you don't trust in God, guess who that could affect? Your children. Guess who that could affect? All the other people that are around you. Your decision to trust in God can negatively affect the lives of all types of other people. When you decide, listen, when you decide to trust in the bottle instead of God and you get behind the wheel, guess what? It affects other people. When you decide to trust in all this other stuff instead of trusting in God, guess what? It affects the lives of other people around you. When God has all the time been sitting here and been saying, just trust in me and you will stand. You will stand if you trust in me. If you trust in me, you'll stand. Guess what? The king of Ahaz does, king Ahaz does not trust God. I don't want us to be like him, amen? I want us to be the one who's trusting in that child who's born of a virgin. Emmanuel, God with us. Let's trust in him. Let's trust in him. I'm not going to really finish out the rest of the text. You get the point this morning. That Jesus is this child. This sign of that God's promises come true. Amen? Jesus is this sign that God is faithful. Jesus being born in the way in which He was born is a sign to you and to me that no matter what is going on in my life, no matter what, I have got to trust in God. I've got to trust in God. That when something bad happens, I don't go calling all types of other people. I go straight to my knees and I begin to trust God. That when something is going on in my life, when the worst circumstances, when threats are coming against me, I'm trusting God. Because I will not stand unless I trust in Him. And when you don't trust in Him, it affects so many other people. Now listen, I think about it as a pastor. If I'm really not trusting in God, if Earl's not really trusting in God, it could affect a lot of people, amen? If our elders and our deacons, and if you as a, as a person who calls Revive Home, if you're not trusting in God, if you're not serving God, if you're not being faithful to God, it can affect a lot of people. If you're a mom or a dad in this place, if you don't trust in God and you don't stand firm in God, and every time a crisis comes against you, your children see you going in other places... 
going, seeing you going in different directions, it's going to affect them, amen? It's going to. Just like the decision that King Ahaz made affected 200,000 Israelites. 200,000 people in the nation of Judah are carried off in exile, out of their home, because of one decision from one man to trust in another king instead of trusting in God. It's like that song that we sung earlier, the anthem. I began to preach another king, amen? I've begun to preach another king. I serve the real king. Not another one. I serve the real king. The question is, are you going to serve the real king, Jesus Christ? Amen? That child who was born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, and died on the cross for your sins. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I know that that text and what's going on in the nation can be difficult. But God, I just pray that verse number 9 stands out to us this morning. Verse 9 and verse 14. Verse 9, that we have to stand firm in you or we will not stand at all. That we have to stand firm. Stand our ground. When things come against us, we've got to stand firm. Stand our ground with you. We cannot trust in other kings. We cannot trust in other kingdoms. We cannot trust in money. We cannot trust in a drink. We cannot trust in anything else except you. Always. Because if we don't, we will fall, God. Lord, I pray for those in this room who have never trusted in your son. Never trusted in that child that was born of a virgin, called Emmanuel, eventually would live a perfect life, die on the cross for their sins, and rise from the grave three days later. If they've never trusted in Him, I pray they understand that they've already fallen. And they will fall in eternity if they do not trust in Your Son. God, Lord, I pray... Make us people who trust no matter what. Make us people, God, when circumstances come against us and things rise against us, we trust in You no matter what. That when whole kingdoms seem like they're coming against us, when the whole kingdom of darkness seems like it's coming against us, we don't trust in anything else, but we trust in you. We trust in your son, and we trust in you to be faithful, because you've always been faithful. You've always came through, and your son, who was born of a virgin, is the sign that that promise is true for us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say, let's stand.